so they can do the housekeeping without the live feed because they don't need to know where the toilets are. Anyways, my name's Michelle and welcome to the library for the word tonight. Um, I'm just going to show you, tell you where the exits are. So we've um, an exit here, a fire exit here on my left, and a fire exit is the other exit is the door you came in. The toilets are just at the entrance as well where you came in too. And if you have, if, could you just switch off your phones now at this stage as well before you start? Um, and so I'd like to welcome you all to the word and also anybody around the world who is watching on our live feed. We're on Facebook tonight. Um, Studio Rove will be doing our live feed for tonight. Um, this word is in association with the IT Sligo BA in writing and literature. And we're delighted this month to have Mary Costello, author of Academy Street. And she'll be reading from her new book, The River Capture. We also have Siobhan Mannion, winner of, among others, the Hennessy First Fiction Award. And we'll have Jared Byrne, author and lecturer of the IT um, hosting the event. Um, just to let you know, the next, oh yeah, the, word, the writers will be reading from their own work and then this will be followed by a Q&A and open mic. And our next word will be happening on Wednesday, the 25th of March, and it will feature authors Anne-Marie Nikiran, August, Aoife Casby. And just to let you know a few of our own things that are coming up, um, we have an open library day happening on Saturday, the 29th of March, that's this, or February, that's this Saturday. And we'll be having a number of um, story times and puppet shows and a flea circus as well for children. And we also be ha holding demonstrations of all our library service and our online services. So if, you, if you're around on Saturday, pop in. Ocean FM will be doing a live, um, a live uh, broadcast from here from 11 till 2. So if you're around, it'd be nice for you to pop in. And also we have a list down the back. I always forget to, get to tell you this every month, but there's a list down the back if you want to put your name down to be notified of future word events. And that's it. I think that's everything. So we'll go ahead. Hey, thank you. Um, you're all very welcome. It's, it's wonderful to see, as ever, just a great turnout for the word. It's been a tremendous success from day one, and uh, thank you all for, for coming. Thank you to uh, Sligo Libraries, of course, for um, working in collaboration with IT Sligo on this uh, great event. And um, as mentioned, I'm a lecturer at, uh, at IT Sligo on the BA Writing and Literature program, so I may be a little biased. But um, for those who are not familiar with the program, it is really a tremendous asset here in the West. It's, it's a unique program. Uh, I've been involved with writing programs in different ways over the years, and this one is very special, I think. Uh, it's a niche program, and it's wonderful to have it here. Um, and so we have two great readers here tonight. We have Mary Costello, and we have Siobhan Mannion. And um, Siobhan is going to start. And Siobhan worked for many years as a radio producer in RTE and is a past winner of the Hennessy First Fiction and New Irish Writer of the Year Award. Her stories, plays and essays have appeared in Irish and international publications, including magazines such as Grant and Winter Papers and anthologies such as Long Gaze Back, Silver Threads of Hope and many others. She's a degree in English and French from Trinity College and a Master's in Film from UCD. And she's written a number of radio plays, as mentioned, and um, one of them, Big Picture, won a bronze medal in the New York Festival Radio Awards. I look forward to hearing tonight from Siobhan. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, can you all hear me OK? Yeah? OK, great. Um, it's lovely to be invited to read uh, with Mary here in Sligo, so thank you. Um, I'm going to read the beginning of a story called Through the Night, which uh, appeared in the Granta New Irish Writing issue. So it's the beginning, so I don't think I need to set it up. <clears throat> On the floor of the hotel corridor, they sit, either side of a bottle of wine. The world dark beyond a huge sloped window, their bodies reflected, slumped against an inner wall. In easy silence, they sip from their glasses, knowing that in a few short hours, they will both fly home. She slides off her shoes, stretches her legs, smooths her new skirt over her thighs. His left foot tips against her right. She holds her breath against this pleasure. A flash of lightning brings her round. Wow, that's some storm, she says. Well, I guess that's the end of that, he says, a sudden energy in his voice. We won't see anything tonight. They have stayed up late to watch the space station, another spacecraft moving in to dock. 
She heard some of the delegates mention it at breakfast, later searched for details online. A crack of thunder vibrates beneath them, rain slashing the floor to ceiling glass wall. In the dim nighttime lighting of the corridor, he makes a move to go. I enjoyed your talk this morning, she says, a little louder now. Did you really, he says, relaxing back down. Which part? Well, all she had really noticed were his hands moving, how he held himself at the podium. He brings his knees to his chest. She takes another mouthful of wine. Her weekend has been spent watching all of them, barely registering their words, concentrating on time passing, one half hour at a time. When his turn came, she could picture him in his studio, throwing colors at a wall. I enjoyed yours too, he says, rescuing her. Especially that last piece you read about your husband. She hands him back the bottle, observes the thrashing of the world outside. Her hotel room waits 12 floors away, graced with its mountain view. Three days she has dressed and undressed there, curtains open, vast sky bearing down. The invitation to come here, the first she has accepted in almost a year. On this, the ground floor, she senses the depth of the valley, the town that pulls away from this enormous building on a mountainside. A cleaner approaches, moving quickly, pushing her cart straight ahead. They make their bodies small. The girl gives no reaction, her soft shoes squeaking over the hard floor. This gathering has brought dozens of them, artists, composers, writers from around the globe. They are the last two, long since kicked out of the function room, all the others gone to bed. You remind me of someone, he says, close to her ear. She notices the threads of darker linen running down the front of his shirt, the slow movement of his chest as he breathes. Are you drunk, he asks. Of course not, no, no, no. She has put the emphasis on all the right syllables, made comedy out of nothing at all. And it comes, the laughter that obliterates the need to make any more talk for a while. They sit, the moment expanding, united by the storm. Tell me about your marriage, he says, after a while. What's to tell? He died, I got old. When she hears it, she feels the truth of it. When she closes her eyes, he squeezes her hand. She welcomes the momentary pressure from his fingers, soft and unexpectedly warm. Do you like living in the city, he asks. Do you usually work from home? They ask questions of each other, new pieces of information standing in for all the years until now. He smells of soap and alcohol. At registration, she saw him see her, knew he would make her acquaintance, seek her out from then on. What's the most beautiful thing you own? She considers this and smiles. Nothing I could show you, she replies. How did your last day go? Good, he says, finishing his wine. Strange that it's the same day, she thinks, lived inside different lives. The storm has eased off, quietened down, the wind driving raindrops across the window. She puts both hands to the floor, which has started to tip underneath her. I shouldn't have come, she says. Thank you. Thank you very much, Siobhan. The next to read is Mary Costello. Mary was born in Galway and has published two novels and a collection of stories to great acclaim. Her collection of short stories, The China Factory, published in 2012, was nominated for the Guardian First Book Award. Her novel, Academy Street, was shortlisted for many awards, including the International Dublin Literary Award, the Costa First Novel Prize, the EU Prize for Literature. The novel went on to win Irish Novel of the Year Award, as well as Irish Book of the Year. Her most recent novel, the River Capture has been described by the Times as one of the most surprising and original novels of 2019. Mary Gossett. Thank you, George. Um, thank you very much to 
Sligo Library and um, Una Mannion and Sligo IT for having me. Um, I have done events with Siobhan before. In fact, Siobhan was the producer of the first book that was on radio of mine, so she, um, she did a great job, and I've always enjoyed doing events with her. Um, I'm going to read a few pages from my novel, uh, The River Capture. Um, it's about a 34-year-old man called Luke O'Brien, who was, a, who was a secondary school teacher and a lover of Joyce, and he leaves the city after the breakup of a relationship with Maeve and returns to live in the country. Um, his house is full of books and uh, a cat. Um, so he's, at this point, he, he is thinking about uh, the life he left in Dublin and occasionally thinks about going back. He really should move back to Dublin. Dublin. In the magical chaos after Josie's death, he had returned to his job in Belvedere College. Then, slowly, over a year, he began to suffer a progressive erosion of the spirit, a steady depletion of reserves. Without Maeve, he lost the run of himself, and the city became a place of freedom and temptation and excess. He drank copiously, spent with abandon, sated old appetites, new desires too. On a staff night out in the dark corner of a nightclub, the young, newly appointed maths teacher, Oshin Kelly, with his fair to reddish hair and delicate cheekbones and tired, misty eyes, put a hand on Luke's arm and looked steadily into his eyes. In the late night, heady mix of dim lights and music and alcohol, he thought Oshin beautiful. Oshin smiled and leaned in and kissed him on the mouth, and he kissed him back and then panicked. I'm not gay, he said. Oshin smiled and shrugged. So? That's the truth, I swear. If I was gay, I'd have been out at 15. Jesus Christ, he thought. What am I, half gay? It was true. If he were gay, he would have been out at 15. He would not have cared. He is his father's son. The truth that all costs, regardless of convention. He looked at Oshin at one of his eyes, then the other, at the smiling mouth, and he kissed him again. Desire rising in the tongue and the mouth, lust in the groin, physical love bred out of spirit and intellect and beauty. Walking in the, walking in the small hours through empty streets to Oshin's place, the body talk, the wicked laughter, the tender touch of Oshin's hand, his lips, the tawny hair on his arms and the dawn light. And then the walk home alone in daylight and the shock, the sickly realization of what he had done. But the next day he returned to Oshin and to days and nights of pure joy and laughter and ecstasy, moments of love and of feeling newly born, followed by hours of self-loathing, fear, doubt, panic at being spotted entering a gay bar. He began to admire men's bodies, their bare arms, square shoulders, round, tight backsides. He began to dress differently. He began to take care of his skin. Mother of God. When he was with Oshin, it wasn't tawdry, but natural. Just sitting together meant something. He didn't know how to describe it. Why do we have to be one thing or another, he thinks. Why do we have to be anything? Does it matter who puts, who, does it matter who we kiss, who fills us with longing? Does it matter who puts what where? The thing he had not foreseen, not expected, was the purity of feeling, the integrity of feeling he had for men, way beyond the physical, beyond mere possession, to do with ease and affinity between men, the protectiveness, the feeling that he could say anything and do anything and nothing had to be explained. One of the first signs of the end of the world, he read once, when men marry men. For a few years it was where the heat was, 
at the source, the nub, the core of a man, the need to be touched and to touch there. He had always loved human touch, human skin, human smells. In the nine months he was with Ushin, he oscillated between moments of searing shame and fear and uncertainty, and the thrill of new adventure, the feeling of opening doors, flinging up windows. Extreme feeling this, living from the heart of the sensorium. He read widely about sexuality, mulled over his own, acted out his own craven fantasies. Alone he contemplated the feminine in himself, and, stirred by desire at the thought of being part woman, he massaged his nipples, ran a finger along his scrotal scar, the vestigial seam of a fetal vagina before its folds fused and his prenatal self became male. He imagined his own labia, a tight cervix, his unborn womb, an ocean of fecundity. He detected a sensitive and feminine element in himself and suspected that, at certain times of the month, he still possessed traces of a rudimentary menstrual cycle that, prone to the pull of celestial bodies, affected his entire organism. The pendulum swung back. He could not bear the thought of being without woman. The carnal pleasures, the emotional intimacies, the feeling of completeness. But the door had opened, and he could not unknow all he now knew or unfeel all he felt. And, and he was the better for it and would not be without this knowledge. He has a theory that the current states of male and female are transitional, intermediary, that mankind is still evolving, and that human evolution will eventually culminate in a single form that contains and integrates both male and female elements in a sophisticated hermaphroditic self. He is convinced the evolutionary pressure is increasing and change is imminent, and he finds the idea of such change philosophically and aesthetically pleasing. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Siobhan, also. Um, the last time I saw Mary was four years ago in April, and it was in Canada at a, chairing a panel on Irish writers. I was at the University of New Brunswick in those days, so it's uh, intriguing to be here four years later seeing uh, with uh, the IT Sligo in similar circumstances. And lovely to see you again, Mary. Um, I'm intrigued the, by, by both of your writing, that, and I'm going to go straight in here into formal elements, but I'm intrigued by your use of present tense and the switching between tenses that, that you do, Mary, as well, in, in some of your, your work, Academy Street opens up as a young girl in, in present tense and then switches into past tense. And even in the piece you read there, it's fluctuating. Um, and Siobhan, your piece is, is also present tense. And uh, we've, you know, th th there is a, a lot more usage of that in recent times, but it certainly goes all the way back. We know that Dickens has done it and uh, Charlotte Bronte has done elements of it in Jane Eyre and so on. But, I mean, for me, I think of Bre Brett Easton Ellis was the first time it really brought it home to me, that immediacy of the tense. The argument against it sometimes is we lose the power of reflection. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious about your use of it and how you decide which tense is appropriate and so on. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, I think um, like a lot of things that you can observe after you've finished writing something, the decisions weren't necessarily made. You reflect afterwards on why you've used a, a certain tense or a technique or a style. Um, I think that um, I'm drawn to writing in close-up. I tend to um, feel as if it's what I'm doing is, is often in quite a short time span in terms of the, the narrative time and that it's... Um, the intensity of the immediate experience. And, and it's exactly what you said. What it limits, then, is the reflection on it. And I was, uh, I'm was i a big fan of Mary's work, and I was listening as you were reading. I've read, um, I've read all your books. But um, in terms of the, I was thinking what you do so well is what I love in, in my own reading is when you feel that 
you feel a, a pulse beating through something. You feel that someone has really represented what it is to live in your life. But you also manage to get the reflection and the thinking of the character's image. I think it's incredibly difficult while still maintaining a reality to the, to the people mm -hmm. and not feeling the presence of the author because it's, it's, very easily, it's very easy to tell the audience as the author, but then you've burst the bubble and you've broken the spell. And a good piece of writing, or I think any um, creative endeavor that succeeds for me, it feels, or um, you, when you experience it, it's, it's like as if it made itself. You kind of forget about the fact that it had a creator because that person isn't imposing. I have a great line now, I'll put this in here. You know, I mean, we, we can all spot that. So. Um, I think I'm just naturally drawn to the present tense because it allows me to do the things that I find interesting in fiction personally, but I don't think about it beforehand. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, I think uh, in, in Academy Street, uh, the first portion, the child test, um, was very consciously written in the present tense because to, I think, capture the consciousness of a child or the moments of a child. A child is very much like an animal in the sense that they live very much in the moment, in the present. So even though Tess's mother dies, she's not thinking of the big grief-stricken moment. She's thinking about that moment there, you know, she's hungry or she needs her tea made or whatever. So uh, I, I very consciously used uh, the present tense at that time because it is the most thing that captures the, the absolute, tight, up-close, present moments of a child's life. I don't think a child is reflective. I don't think they look forward or look back. They don't think of the future. They think of that moment. Um, and in other stories, uh, sometimes I have used the present tense. I, I, I don't consciously set out to do it. But nor do I think that it um, excludes reflection, really. I think the I think you can. I think it's possible to be present and reflective at the same time. I think probably Joyce could do. You know, did it Virginia Woolf in very, very moment, in very, uh, very much so, capturing. As I think she said something like capturing the atoms as they drop for that moment of consciousness, or some quote like that. So I am. Um, I think it is a very useful tense for um, depicting the intensity of a moment. You know, and as as Siobhan says, up close and personal. Okay, thank you. No, and I agree. I think technically there are ways around the lack of reflection. Um, it, it takes a very skilled writer to do it, so yeah. Uh, and along the, the former qualities there, um, you know, I'm just thinking, Siobhan, you work in many forms. You work in short stories, you work radio plays, uh, you've written essays. Um, is that the same thing? You don't think about it? That's just what comes out in, in your writing process? Or do you begin thinking this is more suited to one form, this idea I have is more suited to one form or another? Um, well, sometimes that's determined by if you're lucky enough to be commissioned to do a piece of writing. So then automatically it will be in a particular form, be it an essay or a play. Um, things that I... Um, would that would just would originate with me just deciding to write something I think the short story is my sort of natural habitat and uh, as a reader as well I'm just a big I just I'm a big fan of short stories um, but sometimes people talk about the relationship between a short story and a novel and I think that the short story is actually it's quite unlike the novel, and I think it's much more similar to a play or poetry or film. And the, the reason I, f I feel like that is because um, they're all works you can experience in one sitting. And again, that is related to the intensity of the experience for the person who is reading it or seeing it. Um, and I think it's, I, think it's, um, I mean, Mary obviously has written short story, uh, short stories, and uh, a novel. I'd be interested to see if you think they're uh, how they are related, if at all. But um, I think sometimes people think a short story is sort of a maybe a training ground for a longer piece of work. I think it's the idea, unless it's been commissioned within certain parameters that you then have to accommodate, which can be very helpful as well if you're writing to constraints. That can those challenges can bring about certain creations, as can deadlines, in a way like nothing else. Mm -hmm. But um, I think the story finds its own rhythm and shape and size and form. Right. And, uh, and I'm curious about your time in radio. Is that, has that been something that has really helped you 
get a, a grip on the radio play or the sh short story to understandings that you might not get otherwise? Um, I don't think so necessarily uh, in terms of the writing. It, that, that is something that um, predates my involvement in radio, but um, what is interesting, um, I was talking to students today in the IT about writing for radio, and it's interesting to think about the kinds of writing that work well on radio and why. And just like with any form, how best can you tell whatever this story is, given the constraints but also the freedoms of that form? Um, I was lucky enough to work on, I worked on lots of different arts programs and I worked on what I would describe as writing-based programs, meaning programs that uh, exist on the radio because somebody has written a book. So I was working on the book on one or the short story competitions or the radio drama competitions. And I think actually one of the things that probably gave me for my own writing was to sharpen my editing skills because the first thing you're doing is trying to get rid of everything that is extraneous and really distill whatever it is. In radio, you're doing that, number one, because of time constraints, but number two, because most things can, be, can benefit from editing. So I think I probably became a, mo a more experienced editor by virtue of material that would have been being edited for broadcast. And, and Mary, along those lines, you, you began, came out of the gates running with short story form, and um, we've seen two novels, and two very different uh, types of novels. Um, do, do you move easily between them? Do um, I suppose, uh, deep down, I think everything really can be written as a short story. And I think um, <laughs> the, the originally, uh, the story that uh, became Academy Street was going to be a short story because I love the short story like Siobhan and um, I love what it can do. It's that, you know, delivering those small incremental moments of understanding and perception, you know, that can be registered and appreciated fully. And it, it doesn't happen as much in a novel that you have broader scope and everything, but the weight you can feel from a good short story of, of coming to that sort of um, understanding and uh, um, perception, really, from those small incremental moments. Um, but yes, originally, uh, I, was, I never, don't usually talk about ideas for short stories, but I was meeting a friend one day, and I was telling him about this idea. I was thinking about writing this short story, and I was telling him a little bit about it, which was very unusual. And he just looked at me and said, that's a novel. But before he'd even finished the sentence, I knew it myself, you know, so that's how that happened. Um, but I still think it could be written as a short story, oddly enough. Um, when it comes to novels, I suppose um, I wrote uh, uh, Academy Street uh, uh, chapter by chapter very much like I would have written short stories. So when I wrote the first chapter, I knew the trajectory of the, of the book and where the characters would go. I didn't know everything that would happen, but I, I knew the ending. So um, because I was in the habit of writing short stories and editing them a lot and rewriting them, um, I found the early drafts of my first chapters were terrible. I just couldn't bear to go back to them. So what I, I did is I wrote each chapter and redrafted many, many times before moving on to the next. So I, it, it, it helped me not dread going back, and it helped me raise the bar, I think, for myself because I knew what was behind me was honed as much as I could do it. So I kind of wrote, I used the same... Um, process almost, writing chapter by chapter. I did somewhat similarly with the second novel, but not quite, you know. Okay, well, that's really interesting, the idea of staying with a chapter and getting it right before, mm. before moving on. Um, and, and in Academy Street, of course, you, you take on a whole life effectively in quite a slim mm. book as well, so another really uh, challenging thing. Uh, the River Capture is different, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> River Capture is very different. And, you know, I think w when I teach uh, writing, I often begin classes, a uh, series of classes or a course, um, reminding people, as, as I'll do now, I guess, to remind people that as we're sitting here tonight in, in this library, that in actual fact, we're not really, we're, we're sitting on a planet that is, as we're speaking, spinning around at a thousand miles an hour, right at this moment in time, and hurtling through space, orbiting the sun at 67,000 miles an hour. And I say that not so people will run out and never come back to, to my course again, but I say it to remind people that is the reality of our lives. That is what is happening to us right here tonight. 
and we tend to push that aside. And I, I firmly believe that writing needs, that our writing needs to strive to reach that acknowledgement and to incorporate that in our writing. But I, I'm not saying to them at that time that we, we need to take, you know, that we can do it in the ordinary everyday things, that we can write about that. But you go there. You absolutely go there. There's a pivotal moment in the book, as I see it, and it's not a spoiler for anyone who hasn't read it. And the book just spins off right out into space and just, just heads there. Um, the Guardian, I think, called it audacious. And it is audacious, incredibly uh, risky, a risk well worth taking, absolutely. But um, I mean, I, I'm being it's somewhat vague for people who haven't read the book, perhaps, but really formally challenging for, for a writer to do. Um, how on earth did you have the courage to do that? <laughs> Um, well, just for uh, just to give you a, a quick yeah, explanation of what the river capture, first of all, uh, the title, because it refers to a, a geological phenomenon where one river takes over the route of another river, an older river bed that would be dry. So a river is floating along in one direction and then suddenly changes direction, 90 degree angle, drastically, and drops down onto a lower, drier river bed from, uh, from millions of years ago. And uh, there are a few rivers around the world where this happens to, and uh, where this happens. And um, I, I, in my, my story, the River Sulan, where Luke O'Brien's farm is based on, he moves out of Dublin, he returns to his farm on the bend of the river, right at the, at the river capture. And um, he is very aware of uh, this river capture and how it perhaps was a rupture in the river's existence. He is uh, porous to the vibrations of the landscape in many ways and porous to nature and the mysteries of nature. And uh, when he thinks about this land and how it has happened and this river in ancient times changed direction drastically, he senses it as a great wound that the river was separated the source from the destiny at, the, at meeting the sea. And, um, and he feels that this had perhaps also had a catastrophic effect on the whole landscape around and how, like in psychogeography, how the landscape of an area can affect a people and the people's moods and emotions and lifestyle. And there are areas in his locale, in the town near he lives, where depression is high, addiction is high, suicide is high, and he is very sensitive to the needs of young men and, and people in general. And, uh, so the, the river takes a, a sudden turn, and that is the thematic heart of the novel in a way, because it isn't just the river that takes sudden turns, but L Luke's life as well takes a sudden turn. His love likes, his sexuality takes a sudden turn. His aunt's life takes a sudden turn. And indeed, the novel itself takes a sudden turn. So the first half is moving along in a very straight ar narrative arc, and then suddenly it changes form, as Jared said and the reader is pitched into a sudden catastrophe as well. So you're sailing along, and then suddenly, um, because there's a dilemma halfway through the book, Luke discovers uh, something that happened to his aunt, a terrible injustice, and he is, he has uh, a dilemma, a, a, love, a love dilemma. He has to make a decision, and in order to cope with it, um, he, I use this change in, in, in narrative as a sort of distancing, um, strategy because instead of, uh, you know, when somebody suffers a, a great shock, I think it's often hard to find the language and the language can be sometimes facetious. So um, instead of feelings, I give facts. So there's a, a very close up following of Luke for the next 12 hours and everything is recorded, what he does, what he eats, how he, what he thinks, what he reads. So the reader is up close as a very intimate record. So instead of feelings, we get facts in a way. And um, so it is a sudden catapult, it's, it's a sudden change, and it's a, a sudden um, shock for the reader in many ways. But in doing that as well, um, one of the things about the book is that uh, Luke is a big lover of Leopold Bloom and Ulysses, and uh, he, uh, some reviewers said he's obsessed by Leopold Bloom. I don't think he is, I think he's a lover, but I don't mind if they say he's obsessed, I am too. <laughs> and um, so the, Lu, uh, Joyce's life and Leopold Bloom's life filters through Luke's consciousness a lot of the time. And um, I am a big lover of Joyce, a big lover of Ulysses, and uh, I, he, Joyce was very close to me when I was writing this book. He, he was my muse, you know, I, I had read Joyce in college and loved him and I'd read all the biographies and the letters and 
Brenda Maddox's book, Elman's book, and um, and he, he, you know, I was rereading a lot of this when I was working on this novel, and I couldn't leave it out. You know, you know, everything we write sometimes filters through, or everything we read filters through us, and um, it would have been almost dishonest of me not to have it because it's, it was where the heat was in me. You know, it's I, I have to write where the heat is, and Luke is uh, thinking about Leopold Bloom. He loves Leopold Bloom. He loves his humanity. He's, Leopold Bloom is um, a, a great, compassionate, complex character. Um, Ulysses is, is a manifesto for kindness and, and, um, and uh, compassion. But, um, and so the second half of my book is a question and answer section, and it's a homage to Ulysses. The, the, my second, uh, the second last, the penultimate episode in Ulysses is Ithaca, and it's done in a question and answer form. And when I was coming to this section with Luke, when he had his crisis, it it um, it happened very. It evolved very organically. It just came to me that this was the way. This was there is a sort of a, a tonal leveling in the book at this point, and we remove a good bit of feeling at times. Mm -hmm. And so Luke is thinking about everything that happened, including, as you say, questions that he's interested in science, astrology, and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, when you, I mean, you talk about obsessions filtering through us and so on. I mean, when you came up with the character Luke, did you know at that point he was going to be so interested in Joyce, or was you know did that just emerge as, as the book started? No, he, he it was it was there in the beginning. He was a bookish man and um, a, a thinker and uh, interested in philosophy and things like that as well. But no. Um, you know, I got asked a few times, you know, weren't you brave taking on Joyce? I never felt I was taking on Joyce at mm -hmm. all. I, I, Joyce gave us permission with Ulysses, Joyce, and, and indeed Finnegan's Wake, even bigger challenge, but Joyce gave us permission. You know, he writes about a man going to the toilet. He write, writes about flatulence, frying a kidney. He writes about having a bath, lemon soap. He writes about um, decomposing dead in Hades and transmigration of souls. He writes about looking at the stars. He writes about boiling tea for cocoa. So he gave us everything. The quotidian we can write about. You know, he gave us permission and he he used language. Um, Anthony Burgess is one of the best, I think, uh, who writes about Joyce. And uh, he said that Joyce was so um, Joyce was so convinced of the numinous in the commonplace and in the everyday and in the torrid and the Every, in the sordid and ordinary, he was so convinced of the numinous in, la, in, in the everyday that he had to manipulate that he manipulated language to accommodate that, right. and so made us newly aware of language. And that's the truth. Uh, um, uh, William Faulkner said Joyce was electrocuted by divine fire, and that's the way I feel. That, you know that I, I I can't get over Joyce. I can't get over the fact that he's dead. Sometimes he, only, he was only 58 when he died. I can't believe you know that we lost him so quickly in in, in that time. You know, so um, yes, I was I was so in, I am so in love with Joyce that I couldn't deny him in my book. You know, that's he just made his way. Bloom burst onto it. <laughs> And Siobhan, do you have obsessions that creep into your writing? Is that how it works? Um, I, I was interested there listening in terms of, um, because you don't describe it in terms of research, you describe it in terms of what was already something that you were, you were passionate about, because there's so much in that book. Um, and I don't think I have a, I don't think I have a, um, a similar, passion like that, but I think I have topics that I return to, but I think, um, again, it's you sort of retrospectively look at things and realize that they have patterns to them. Um, there might be subjects that you return to, you know, like grief or loss or, but they're, they're quite broad. I think they're things you can see in lots of pieces of writing. I've only had one, um, I've only uh, written one thing that required research, which was a radio play I did, which was from the point of view of a costume designer on a film set. And I did a lot of research for it because a lot of the um, play was about the making of things. And I wanted to understand how this character would make and then would feel about the things that she made. And then I did, or I hope I did, what you know what you need to do to let to let the work speak for itself which is to find out 
you know, far more than I would ever need to know, but to allow that to sort of a few pertinent details filter down and become something that spark off something you didn't, you wouldn't have been able to write about previously. But um, no, the, the short answer to your question is no, I don't think I have a similar passion. <laughs> okay, <Yet>. Thank you. <laughs> and, and I just want to repeat something that Mary mentioned a minute ago, which was that Ulysses and Bloom was like a manifesto for compassion and kindness. I just thought that was lovely. Yeah. Um, not enough kindness and compassion in our writing sometimes. Yeah. Um, when we did last interview, Mary, and this is a question for both of you, when we did that last interview in Canada at the time, the idea at that time was really to, um, Michelle Forbes was in that panel and Dara McKeown, and we talked a bit about the state of Irish literature, and at the time I was very enthusiastic about all the new writers that were emerging and coming through, and really strong writers, um, that were, were emerging, and we, we did discuss that. Since then, four years later, there's a, a lot of new writers again emerging, uh, really new novel voices coming through. Um, how, for both of you, is this an enthusiastic time to be a writer in Ireland? I mean, do you sense that, or do you still feel that it's, it's kind of, uh, while it might feel that way, there are still a lot of discrepancies in terms of certain voices and minority voices that are not coming through? How do you feel the state of Irish literature is right now? <laughs> Um, well, I think it's a great time to be a reader. I don't know um, if it um, if what's happening ex sorry excuse me externally affects how you feel as a as a writer in terms of the the scene. I mean, I am still at the point of not having published a book, so I've published um, individual stories and had plays broadcast, but I'm still in the so-called emerging category where I'm emerging from my cocoon, and I've been there quite a while, but. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, as a reader, it's fantastic, because I'm sure all of the new writers that you were discussing four years ago, it's, it's a whole new, there's probably two new sets of writers since then that are, you know, widely read and um, doing really well. But obviously, there's always room for more voices, and there's, you know, um, um, Mary and I are both in the Long Gaze Back anthology, which was um, Sinead's, Sinead Gleason's effort to redress some of the gender imbalance in the history of um, publishing, and specifically Irish publishing. But I mean, gender isn't the only category of diversity that people should be paying attention to. So um, I think as um, you know, uh, editors and publishers, um, you would hope, are paying attention and giving room to new voices. But I, I always feel a bit like um, I'm not a great person to talk about the the industry from the writer's perspective. I still feel very sort of, um, I'm, I'm just figuring out the steps as I go along. But as a reader, I see, but have always seen that there's always great writing out there. And, you know, Ireland is a country that is, you know, very internationally um, des deserving of its reputation of, of great writing and continues to do that. And there's like younger voices. And so it seems, it, it seems very healthy to me as a reader. I'm interested in more voices coming out. Um, I um, I'm interested in um, a book that I'd asked for for Christmas, but only arrived the other day, which was the um, anthology of the writers who are in direct provision, the book that was edited by Jessica Trainer and Stephen Ray. Um, so again, that's a, obviously, I mean, there's a, a, a few missions there in publishing that book, but one of them as a reader would be to just hear other voices, voices that you are not familiar with, which it's in, when you were mentioning, um, talking about kindness in the world. And I mean, you know, writing itself, I think, is an act of empathy and reading and the people who read, it is, it is also an act of empathy and you obviously can't get enough of that, so. Okay, thank you. Mary? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with Siobhan and um, I don't, uh, even though, yes, a writer, I'm, I'm not always um, cognizant of what happens, you know, in the publishing world or the mechanics of it necessarily, but of course, everything that raises consciousness about diversity, whether it's gender, it took, it's still taking a long time for the gender issue to catch up. And thankfully, because of, um, you know, a huge paradigm shift in society, whether it's the Me Too movement or um, awareness of, uh, direct provision. There, there are a race or religion or sexuality. There is, um, there has been a, a, a very welcome shift, I think, in societies in the West anyway. 
about these issues, and hopefully the knock-on effect will be felt in publishing. It's slow. It's always slower to come out. I remember at the time of the, the boom and the bust as well, people were saying, where are the bust novels? Where are the novels about the economy? Writing is always you know, a decade behind, maybe. So yes, it, it, and it's always lovely to uh, read something different. I remember when Emer McBride's book, Girl is a half Form Thing, came out. I rushed to buy it, you know, because it's nice to get something different and exciting and uh, radical in a way. So um, it's, it, it is nice. I, I, I do welcome that. Yeah. And I think we're seeing a lot of benefits of smaller presses who are yeah, willing absolutely. to take the risks and um, not their eyes are not as focused maybe on, on profit making and so on on that. And the discovery of new voices through journals and small presses and, yes. you know, yeah. yeah that people have can have a sort of history of publication before a book actually comes out and it's just a way of you know hearing more voices okay yeah. well listen we are at about 7 20 and i think we're going to um finish up the interview there and i really want to thank uh siobhan and mary for um their responses and their uh collaboration there thank you very much So at this point, it's your turn. You're on. Um, if anybody out there has any questions for, the, um, for our readers here tonight, we'd be delighted to take them. kind of half answered this already, but how conscious um, a, a change of style was it towards the end? Did that, was that what you were working towards all along, or was it an unconscious kind of, pro what happened for you at the desk, I suppose, is what I yeah. wonder. Um, it, it, you're, uh, you're right, I did say that in class today, that usually I know the tra trajectory of the novel, especially I knew with Academy Street, I didn't know everything that happened in between. And with um, the river capture, I knew the ending as well. I knew his story, and I knew the ending. However, I didn't know about the change of direction it was going to take with the Q and A with the Ithaca section. I didn't know that until I came to it. I, I cut out about twenty or thirty thousand words before that. Actually, I had more of a story of Ellen. Originally, this this book was going to be about Ellen's story. It was going to be mm, a little bit like Academy Street character, you know, only a woman that has been wronged, you know, there's an injustice has been done. Um, but it very quickly after starting it, I realized it was Luke's story. Luke became prominent and with him, Leopold Bloom, etc. cetera. But, um, but I did not know when we came, when I came to the crisis for Luke, you know, for his difficulty, um, I stalled a little bit and um, I just didn't want to, it just didn't seem appropriate to, you know, toss out his feelings and have him try and solve his dilemma and come to terms with it in an ordinary way, in an ordinary narrative. Um, and uh, it, it literally dropped down to me one day and uh, I, I, I just knew instantly that I wanted to change and do it like this. And I, I wasn't at all thinking about the theme of a river capture changing direction, anything like that. That just <laughs> afterwards, you know, when I sent the book to my publishers, I started thinking, oh, this actually, you know, there's been a whole lot of capturing happening here, and I ha wasn't aware of it at the time. But no, I didn't know it was going to change direction. Anybody else with a question out there? No? OK. Thank you very much. You let them off way too lightly, <laughs> you know. Thank you, so, Jared. No, you're welcome. Thank you very much. So at this stage in the evening, we're going to um, have the open mic, and we'll be handing over to Ollie Lenehan to host the open mic tonight and pass over to her uh, right now. Thank you to Jared and to Mary and Siobhan for the lovely readings. 
I am first on the list because I always perpetually get here in half an hour early. So I'm just going to do my bit and then hand you over to everyone else. This is Miss Connections. I have hummed soft and yellow in the dark, wrapped in a dog hair duvet at 3 a.m. in your living room. And when I think of you embracing me, the time that has passed since opens up below me and stretches for miles. I am a half-frozen gull flying across the Irish Sea to you, but getting lost in the mist. And it has been three weeks since anyone last hugged me. I forgot we were allowed to touch other humans. Missed connections. I forgot until you did it, like it was expected and natural, and like you can just touch arms and chests and backs, just like that. I have glowed so dim and butter yellow in your living room, listening to voices in the kitchen, feeling the light shaft softly across through and how the shadow fell over my face. I told you I dropped off as soon as my head hit the pillow, but I lied. I stayed awake listening to you talk and thinking about your teeth and the bones in your face and the glitter on your cheeks. Missed connections. 8 a.m., I sidestepped the stickiness on the floor as I left, stared at myself, pre-anything, in the mirror in the bathroom under the stairs, walked to catch the bus in the morning light, thinking of you still sleeping. Missed connections. If I were to stare at life over again with all the knowledge I know now, all I know is that I would use it to find you sooner. Thanks. And second reader is Jessamine O'Connor. Hello. I'm a student as well at the IT. I am mature. And uh, I just. I just was writing a poem this week for one of the classes with Alice Lyons, and I wrote it about this shawl that my friend gave me, and she was going to be coming tonight, so I was finishing the, trying to get the poem ready, but she's not able to come. So it's called In Carol's Shawl. So In Carol's Shawl. I'm told I look like Cleopatra by my daughter, but still, I do look regal somehow, in opulent purple, or is it blue? The bluest, darkest, brightest blue I've ever owned or even worn. It runs in deep canals between slabs of gold, proper gold with tassels on. The whole shawl glows, exudes a musty kind of wealth, health, and poise. I wrap it proudly around my shoulders to, or make a tent of it over my head to hide like an ostrich from people I love. It smells of cupboard, and I meant to wash it at first, but it doesn't bother me now. It's not irritating, just the right kind of must. It makes me think of my friend who gave it to me because she's dying and is passing on all her favorite things and how we sat in my kitchen just a few weeks ago, drinking cocktails and playing Bananagram, her in a fabulous swirl of colors and me in her beautiful shawl like Cleopatra. Next up is Louise Cole. I'm actually Louise G. Cole. Um, uh, the G is there because if you Google Louise Cole, you get an underwear model, who isn't me. And I'm going to read um, Soft Touch, which is the title poem from my uh, Laureate's Choice uh, pamphlet from last year. It's been out a year already. Soft Touch. And it's, it's, about, it's about me, but it's all because I am a soft touch, but it's also about fabric. Soft touch. Stroking the na navy-legged thighs of a woman who used to be me, daydreaming at the traffic lights, lost in the fabric feel of fantasy, holding a freshly minted babe in arms, sleepy wrapped in a bunny print baby grow, poppers snapped against wriggle, leaning against the still-taut muscles of a former six-pack, strained against stained singlet, curled silver chest hair peaking. Embarrassed by smooth gussets, newly washed panties immodestly teetering atop Monday's laundry pile, laundry should have put away sooner pile. Hiding in a rock chick t-shirt, faded into overworn nightwear, colorless soft cotton comforter at bedtime's long, lonely stretch, distracted by
by indecently tight white boxes, clinging. I'm hot blushing, not knowing where to look, but I'm looking anyway. Or here's me, grey polishing cloths formerly known as clothing, now dusting shelves, mopping spills, rubbing a shine onto mirrors, reflecting my life almost done. Thank you. Next reader is Nika Navratska. Um, so the title of the poem is Ocean. If I could dive into the ocean, put one foot after the other, feeling the waves embrace me quietly, feeling cold through every inch of my body, I would. The wind is howling loud. The waves come and go like my emotions. Splash, splash. I want to gather shells from the deepest of the sand. Let my body be consumed by the blue of the waters. It's so quiet here, like in a dream I want to live in. The love here is comforting, and you are that ocean to me. Next up is Emil Kena. The first one is The Night Nostalgia, which I wrote on the back uh, when I was going back from a trip to Kareko Shannon. So, uh, The Night Nostalgia. There is something different about the night, whether, it's the, well, whether it is the way the raindrops glitter on the bus windows, or the way they appear and disappear, or the way I know the day is over and I'm going home. The music I'm listening to sounds different, clearer, as if the loud bus the voices were no longer a part of my life. There's something intimate about looking at his face in the dimly lit bus, something sadder about the sur surroundings that pass by, something nostalgic about all the houses and towns. I want to go home. At night, this is where I would go. But do I really know where is my home? And, and the second? And the second is a villanelle that I wrote for one of my classes in IT Saigo. And I'm going to be actually reading it to the class tomorrow, but I will. Um, <laughs> if only I knew how to stop the crying. If only I knew how to stop the crying. My eyes, my eyes are sore from the tears, all puffy and red. But I cannot do anything except trying. And it seems only I know that I'm dying. With every tear, a piece of me lives. lives and I feel as... And, sorry. And I feel so dead. If only I knew how to stop the crying. And sometimes it's terrifying that often there's so many tears I cannot see ahead, but I cannot do anything, anything except trying. And I don't want to be fighting, and so I leave all the messages on red. If only I knew how to stop the crying. And it doesn't matter what I'm buying. Nothing makes me happy, just fills me with dread. But I cannot do anything except trying. I don't want to get up anymore, all I do is lying. Sometimes it feels like I'm in a deathbed. If only I knew how to stop the crying, but I cannot do anything except trying. Next reader is Colm Lawler. Uh, <clears throat> this is a short story that I finished yesterday, so it's my first of the year, uh, called Terrible Things. <clears throat> when I am ready, I go into her room. It's just how she left it, her walls covered in posters and peeling paint, her bed unmade, her desk all a clutter. I don't know where to start, but I have to, so I do. I start digging down her posters, all these artists I've never listened to and films I've never seen, but know all about because she loves them. I always love listening to her talk about the things she loves, loved, she loved them. I make her bed, tuck in her navy sheets, shake out her pillow, then remember that the bed's staying empty. I take off the sheets and the pillowcase and the duvet cover and I leave them in a pile outside the door. <coughs> I start to sort the things in her desk. There's all sorts on here. Books, a glasses case, bobby pins, nail polish, stray bits of string, coins, and a few currencies. Under a pile of worksheets, I find a clock that hasn't ticked in a long time, and there's a mostly full tub of chewing gum. I sort the books into piles, alphabetically by author. I put all the empty coins into a coin purse. I pop, it, I pop a chewing gum into my mouth, and I put the worksheets on the bed to figure out later. Everything else goes into an empty Tupperware I find on the ground. 
I pause before the closet doors. Of all the things in her room, the clothes are the most her. Eventually, I swing them open and find the ghost of a girl in floral prints and horizontal stripes. Her more everyday clothes would have already been moved out or in some washer dryer somewhere, so her fancier stuff is still, like, uh, still here, unlike her. I start checking, und checking individual garments for tears, holes, spots to be sewn. The, the ones that are still in decent nick I put into a pile to be given away. The others I put aside to see what I can't fix. When most of the clothes have been sorted, <clears throat> something in the back of the closet catches my eye. I reach in and pull it out carefully. As soon as I wrap my hand around it, I know exactly what it is, but I still have to pull it out of the darkness to make it real. It's a mug that she made in a sculpting class when she was seven years old, and it's ugly as sin. It melted as it solidified, so whatever shape it was trying to be, isn't. I remember her holding it up to me with that beaming smile on her face as if she expected me to know exactly what it was supposed to be. I suppose she did, but I really had no idea. I still don't. It's so many different colors. It's red, and it's yellow, and it's purple. It's got the trappings of a face, but not necessarily a human face. It could be a monkey or a disfigured rhino. It could be a cloud, and I read it as such, but I can't focus. Whatever it is, it's hideous. A tear drops onto its face, and I realize that my knuckles have gone white from how hard I'm gripping it. I can't stand to look at this fucking thing. I raise my hand to smash it on the ground, but someone catches my wrist. Julia, my sister's voice, stop. Gentle as her words, she slowly lets go of my arm. I don't understand, Ruby. I turn to see her worried face. It's hard, I know. She rubs her hand on my shoulder. No, not, not that. I mean this. I hold up the mug for her to see. I don't understand this. Ruby takes it into her hands and examines it with eyebrows raised, pushing up her glasses as if that will make it any less inscrutable. What is it? That's a very good question. It's a mug she made. Oh. Her face softens at the idea. Right, that's cute, right? But the thing is absolutely disgusting. Only I didn't want to say it. So why is this the one thing in the room that makes me cry? Ruby looks around at my handiwork, all the sorted desk items, the pile of clothes, the stripped bed, and the wall. I mean, if I had to guess, I'd say nostalgia. Well, yeah. These things are all present her, she gestured around the room, her clothes, her book, her makeup. These things continue to be a part of her life. This mug is past her, its specific memory, and it's been, it been hidden since it happened. Yeah, and I wanted to be gone like her. I tried to pull it out of her hands, but she clamped onto it firmly. No, you don't. Keep it. It's nice to have keepsakes, but it's terrible. She loosened her grip slightly and gave me a soothing smile. Sometimes we must learn to love terrible things. She placed the ugly vessel on the empty desk in front of us, where both of us could see it, and I crumpled into her arms like an ash cloud. Next up is Ian Doherty. So this is an excerpt from a script I'm working on. Will walks among the tombstones. There is fresh snow on the ground. He comes to his father's grave. Jack Ward, 1972-2010, RIP. Hey, Dad, it's been a while. You didn't miss much this decade. It's been one long river of bullshit, and I don't know how the hell I'm supposed to keep swimming. A voice comes from beneath the ground. Oh, stop whining, you little bitch. I regret not finishing on your mother's tits. Victor floats out of the ground. Can I get a goddamn minute here? Sorry, am I not the dead guy you wanted to talk to? He floats towards an open grave. If you want to talk to him or me or fucking Shakespeare, you know where to find us. He sinks into the grave. Will stands over it. Hop in. Fuck you. What are you so afraid of? You hate everything and everybody. You take no joy from life. The world is just a little bit worse because you're in it. If I'm dead, you should be dead too. Now stop being a pussy and get in the ground. You know how I know you're not actually Victor? How? because you don't sound like him. You sound like me, the voice in my head I've had since like, I can remember. Stupid, worthless shit, why do you even try? I have a black belt in beating myself up. Victor wouldn't have said these things to me. He would want me to live. You are PTSD or brain damage or something, and I am not gonna let you drag me under. Well then get used to me, Ward, because no matter what pills you swallow, what overpaid quack you get to stroke your hair and tell you you're a good boy, I am never, ever going away. Bring it, bitch. Next up is Kate Gilmartin. Hi, I'm one of Gerard Byrne's students, and this is a very short part of the story that I'm starting to write. Let me 
lights on. The sun shone brightly through the thin curtains in the room, and her first thoughts on wakening was the nightmare of her situation, which constantly tormented her. Oh God, another long, lonely, hot day ahead, she thought. Her mouth and throat were dry, and she was overcome with anxiety and longing for her mother and the security of her family home. She looked at the newborn baby boy lying sleeping in the cot next to her and felt nothing but the pain of her loneliness. She was now out of bed and her hands shaking with emotion, she reached for her cigarettes and thought about Andrew and how he had let her down when she needed him most. Sadie had been brought up in a very strict Irish Catholic household in London. She had always been a very anxious, nervous child. The oldest of six, Sadie had never got on with her mother. She had never felt loved by her and had abandonment issues through being left when she was 18 months old, which sadly would affect her throughout her life. Next reader is Siobhan Hickey. This is the list, Jared. <laughs> okay, better get my glasses out now. I hope I don't bore you too much now. A suitcase in the corner of a cafe, a tea bag floating in a cup, a baby's changing mat in a bathroom, a Christmas decoration in February, a Rubik's cube, a wetsuit hanging over a bath, a black and white framed photo of a young man holding a, holding a certificate, Ducks landing on a pond, leaving trickles in the water. A raindrop falling from the branches of a tree. A shower of rain followed by a rainbow. A seagull perched on top of a street lamp. Two birds in flight. One bird on a telephone wire at sunrise. A bush blown over by a storm. A solitary daffodil in a garden swaying to its own tune. So we're going to have our last reader now. Thank you to everybody who read and to everyone else who came. The last reader is Brian Sexton. Um, so this is kind of for the benefit of these, those of you that don't know already, but extraterrestrial superweapons are very easy to break. And the problem with transporting an extraterrestrial superweapon through deep space is that it's actually pretty boring. It can be tempted to play with the settings just to speed things along, which never ends well. You can just ask Jerry McLaughlin, or maybe don't, he's pretty embarrassed about the whole thing and would prefer if it was never mentioned. But I'm going to tell you anyway. The story begins with a computer game called Killer Robots. It was the latest creation from PC Mania Games and was due for release in April 2020. Jerry loves his games, he was in town at 9am on Wednesday the 1st, and by 9.01 he was at the counter game shop looking for a copy of Killer Robots. We're doing a delivery after lunch, said the assistant. Fine, Jerry replied, I'll wait. He then stood staring at the wall for five hours. Jerry really loved games. Just after lunch, and much to the relief of the staff in GameStop, Jerry went home with a copy of the game. He sat down at his computer, shoved the breakfast leftovers and a pile of unopened bills to one side, put on his virtual reality headset and plugged in the game. And this is when the trouble started. You see, Killer Robots asked for a username and Special Agent Fuel and Voice was the best Jerry could come up with. Thanks for checking in, came the voice from inside Jerry's headset. We've been monitoring signals from this planet for eons and you are the first special agent to make contact. Yeah, was all Jerry could reply. He wanted to be virtually smashing virtual robots to smithereens and not listening to some COD sci-fi game introduction. My name is Agent Red Tide, came the voice again. It is an honour to talk with a special agent, even if it is in such unfortunate circumstances. The rebellion against the collective is spiralling out of control, and we desperately need someone to activate the Give me strength. Skip intro, Jerry snapped. My apologies, Special Agent Fuel Invoice, came the voice again. I am not familiar with that code word, but I am sure the collective will appreciate your enthusiasm. I can teleport you to the location of the ship which you will need to escort the weapon here yourself. It goes without saying that the Collective would not request such a thing if the situation was not so desperate. Fast forward, skip to the end, level up. Do you not require a situation update, the voice asked. What do you think? muttered Jerry through his headset to nobody in particular. And with that, he was instantly transported to a giant spacecraft hidden within the ice rings of Saturn. Jerry found himself standing in what looked like the control room. An array of translucent controls hung in the air around him. The walls took the form of giant windows running from floor to ceiling, magnifying the view outside. 
Powerful lights from the ship had lit the surrounding ice crystals in an impressive display. He had never seen so many stars, and in the distance, just visible through one window, Earth. One minute Jerry had been eating stale toast and wondering how to pay the gas bill. The next, he was a starship commander, about to lead the defence of an alien civilization from killer robots. Jerry felt very happy with his 37 euros 99 purchase. Weapon systems, online, he barked. Systems activated, replied the ship's computer. Running system checked. The spaceship shuddered. Several rows of control lights began to blink in sequence. Jerry could hear machinery whirring and humming into life in the body of the ship below. It creaked and buzzed and clanked and whirred some more. Eh, muttered Jerry. How long is it going to take? Six months for a system check, or 1.6949 of a local planetary cycle, came the reply. Six months? Jerry was starting to get irritated. How long do I to start killing robots? Once the system is activated, the journey to the collective homeworld will take half a local cycle, or 14.75 Earth years, informed the computer. What the hell are you supposed to do during all that time? Jerry wondered aloud, looking about the control room. It is practice that a special agent uploads the status update of their planet to the collective during systems check, replied the computer, to determine if the planet is suitable for inclusion in the collective. The ship's computer was starting to think that special agent fuel invoice was not actually a special agent at all. What? A status update? Ah, this game's a joke. Game over, Jerry Bart. Apologies, I am not familiar with that command. Please rephrase, replied the computer. Jerry looked around the room again. It all suddenly seemed very real. He was starting to think that he was not actually in a game at all. Jerry gave a bit of thought to life on Earth, compared it to life as a swashbuckling alien commander, and decided to play along. Days turned to weeks. Life on board the ship turned out to be pretty good. The ship's computer could repl replicate any food he desired. Jerry documented everything he knew about Earth, which included a surprising amount of information on how to destroy alien robots. He found himself learning all about the collective and the workings of the spaceship. He grew in confidence too. If only there was a way to speed things along, he thought. A commander like me can surely modify a ship to travel faster through space. Then he had an idea. When the weapon system is online, transfer all its power to our propulsion engine, he ordered the ship's computer. The computer set the system as requested. It still doubted that the man of war was actually a special agent, but he sounded confident and certainly seemed keen to destroy the robot enemy. The day came when six months had passed and the ship's computer began to count down to the weapon activation. Five, four, three, two, Rerouting weapon systems to their propulsion engine. Boink. Clang. <laughs> Weapons and propulsion systems destroyed, announced the computer. Wait, what? exclaimed Jerry. Weapons and propulsion systems destroyed, repeated the ship's computer. But how? Why? What kind of ship's computer destroys its own engine? asked Jerry. He was now panicking. What kind of special agent asked the ship's computer to destroy its own engine? asked the computer, said the computer. You're not really a special agent at all, are you? No, muttered Jerry. So what happens now? Nothing, replied the computer. Without propulsion, we would just orbit Saturn until the sun dies. The ship was quiet without the noise of its engines. The computer eventually broke the silence. Would you like me to teleport you back to Earth? Yes, said Jerry sheepishly. Jerry found himself sat at home next to a dusty computer. He removed his virtual reality headset, the battery of which had long since died. He sighed. The first human being to command an actual starship and fight against actual killer robots. And I made a pig's ear of it. He vowed never to tell anyone about what had happened. But, you know, sometimes it's better to share these things, just in case someone else finds themselves in the same situation.